breakfast it in the middle of a jungle, and very soon land is inaccessible to people. Uh, even though land was free, 10 years before, uh, 10 years later, it's totally inaccessible to people, even when you find some oil, for example, or whatever. This is just pictures of Colombian cities all over the place. And then you can see the land. You know, the owner of this land is very happy about this illegal development because then it, the government has to bring water and roads and buses, and then this land goes up very much in price. It's very likely that the owner himself gave this half free to these people so it would force government to bring utilities there. <laughs> it really happens very often. In Bogota, this is the surroundings of Bogota, where about half the city initially started out as illegal. Bogota is very high up in the mountains, about 2,600, but these slums are even much higher up. Illegality, of course, leaves poor public spaces, inadequate locations, no parks. Adjacent to Bogota, there are tens of thousands of hectares of flat land, but the poor continue to be forced to illegal neighborhoods because the, private, the land is private, and if people have higher incomes of lower interest rates or whatever, or higher government subsidies, then whatever we gain from subsidies or from higher income, then land prices go up and you lose whatever you have gained elsewhere. So you can never catch up. It's like the dog, the, the rabbit in the dog races. The, it, it doesn't matter how fast the dog races, it will never catch the rabbit. So this is the new, new slums growing up. This was a severe failure of the Colombian state that half of Colombian cities grew out initially as slums, in some more and some less. My respectful suggestion is, in order to avoid the same mistake, Indian government should acquire most of the rural land around its cities, or else the same thing will happen, and Mumbai will be two or three or four times as big, and the problems will only get bigger, as uh, uh, architect Charles Correa was mentioning before, that this uh, is not going to be solved if we continue to do the same. We have to do, therefore, as everywhere, two things. One, slum improvement, make slums legal, supply them with water, sewage, schools, parks, public transport, pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure. But also we should do something to avoid the city from continue to growing in slums. What is it that we are going to be doing? One thing is to do, dissolve what they exist, but then what to do so that they don't grow in the future. We have legalized in Colombia traditionally slums. This is a more or less in the process of improvement now. Legal. I mean, as they are so freely, so, so almost legal, so they really have streets and then we put uh, all services and then becomes the, the legal city, the normal city, like this. And we improved a lot like this and then with shops and a normal city in uh, the working. Colombia has a very, uh, Colum utilities have a very high cross subsidies. Upper income people may pay up to 10 times more for the same water as the poorer people. And this is how about 100% of homes in Bogota have running water and electricity. Practically 100% are connected to sewage systems. More than 90% have drainage system. Nearly 90% have pipe gas through cross subsidy system. Beyond making low income neighborhoods legal and providing them utilities, I would like to emphasize on something different. Measures can be taken in order to truly create inclusion, a sense of belonging and even of pride, respect for human dignity. Small public works with high community participation can strengthen community organization and create self-esteem. But we have to work on pedestrian infrastructure. I mean, we cannot just simply put roads through the slums or through poor neighborhoods. Because these are for cars. We have to make infrastructure for people. Sidewalks, parks, schools, libraries, infrastructure for people. So this is the type of thing. We, we made hundreds of these things. Communities themselves proposed them, designed them, and, and got in contracts with them to be built. Small uh, pedestrian streets like this, or uh, sidewalks, uh, stairways such as this. But I'd like to emphasize that the real conflict for space and funds in cities between cars infrastructure, 
the, the real conflict is between cars infrastructure and social infrastructure, such as schools, libraries, hospitals, and parks. If we really want to solve the problems of the poor, we have to make a very crucial political decision, and it's somehow decide that we are going to make more and more and more and more highways every time we have a traffic jam. Because there is a huge conflict for space and for funds. If we decide that every time we have a traffic jam, we are going to make bigger highways, it will never be possible to solve the needs of the poor in poor cities. Like temples, quality buildings are symbols which create values, such as churches where in medieval uh, towns, uh, children's nurseries, schools, libraries. This is, for example, in a very poor neighborhood, top quality school with the best architecture and conditions. Or this one here, and you can also see the mass transport here. Another top quality school in the, in the border of the city, in the, very, very high up in the mountains. Schools like this, in the poorest neighborhoods. Here, even a pedestrian street only. In the poorest neighborhood, and then community centers, indoor swimming pools, schools. Here we made this library, great library. Then this, uh, this was very poor around here. Then this attracted a little bit higher income development, uh, even uh, shopping areas. And, uh, of course, this whole area. Dispensing free food can help the poor, but it does not create equality and self-esteem. Good. Architecture for people, not for motor cars, can create equality and self-esteem. And I'm not an architect, I must say. <laughs> Uh, this is a picture of lack of democracy. Clearly, in this society, car owners are more important than pedestrians. This is a picture of underdevelopment, of lack of respect for human dignity. This is in, in Nairobi. Clearly, the road is well paid, but the pedestrian spaces are just mud. Again, in Dar es Salaam, people do not exist, except if they are car owners, even children, even school children. Public pedestrian space is a symbol of respect for human dignity. So if we are going to improve slums, we have to make investments in pedestrian, quality pedestrian spaces. In low-income communities where people do not have cars, quality pedestrian infrastructure creates inclusion and equality.